And Lord, it's those who receive you who have the right to be called children of God. And Lord, the way we receive you is through our belief. And so, Lord, we are gathering together of believers here today. We're all like-minded, and Lord, all have come into the kingdom the same way. And because of that, we just seek to be taught and instructed by our Father. And so, God, just speak to our hearts. Meet each person here, Lord, we pray, where they are at and the things that we're dealing with, that, God, we may produce lives that glorify you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to turn to your neighbor and tell him, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. We were going to sing happy birthday to you. Oh, well. <laughs> I told him. As soon as he's done singing. <laughs> Merry Christmas. Go ahead and turn your Bibles to 1 John chapter 5. We'll be picking up at verse 9. And again, if you arrived here today without a Bible, we'd like for you to follow along. And there should be one in front of you underneath the seat. But if there isn't, if you'll raise your hands, the ushers will bring one to you. Does anybody need a Bible? Everybody's good. All right. Well, two things. First of all, I have some, some hard news, but good news. Um, Linda Kalinowski, her mother, Josie, the angels came for her last night. And so she's in the presence of God now. And um, she had been sick and frail, as most of us know, for quite a long time. And um, Linda called me on Thursday night and said that her mother was close. And uh, we prayed for her on Thursday night. Well, we got a text this morning that uh, Josie has gone to be with the Lord. And so we'll, we'll pray for her. So go ahead and stand for the reading of God's word. And um, I'm going to lift up the Kalinowski family. And, um, and then we'll, we'll read our scripture and go from there. Father, I lift up uh, Linda. I pray for Bob. He's here, um, Josie's son. And just pray, Father, for the family as a whole. God, that you would do a good work. Lord, we have that, that hope and that knowledge, Lord, that she's with you. But still, Lord, you have created us to be people, Lord, whose hearts break at times, that we mourn for the, for the loss. We mourn for, for even the loved ones who have passed on. And so, Father, I just pray that you would meet this family in the midst of all they're dealing with. And God, that truly you would be their peace that surpasses understanding. And so, Lord, just meet them, bless them, watch over them, and keep them, we pray. And Lord, we just pray right now for our study that you would bless us in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're 1 John chapter 5, verse 9. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God, which he has testified of his Son. He who believes in the Son of God has the witness in himself. He who does not believe God has made him a liar because he, he, <clears throat> because he has not believed the testimony that God has given of his Son. And this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. Now this is the confidence that we have in him. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. If anyone sees his brother sinning a sin which does not lead to death, he will ask and he will give him life for those who commit sin not leading to death. There is sin leading to death. I do not say that we should pray about that. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is sin not leading to death. And so, Father, once again, we just pray that you will give us wisdom and understanding in your word, God, that we would do these things, apply these things to our lives, Father, and just live lives that honor you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead and be seated. We've spent quite a, a, a lot of time looking at what is being spoken of in verses 9 through 13, and so I'm just going to touch on it momentarily, and then we're going to spend the majority of time on verses 14 through 17. Now, the witnesses are what we have been talking about. These are these tests, the, the witnesses, the, these proofs. Well, the witnesses are the love that we have for the brethren. It's the witness that is inside of us. And that's what John has been saying all along. If you've got a love for the brethren, that's part of the proof that you're born again. 
Another proof that you're born again, another one of the witnesses is that you desire to practice righteousness, to live a life that is pleasing to God based upon the Word of God. And, and another proof, another witness is the knowledge, the reality, and the belief in who Jesus Christ is. Now, we looked at the witnesses of God last week. We, we saw the water, the blood, and the Spirit. The water, well, when Jesus was baptized, the, the witness of the Father, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. The blood, the blood speaks of the cross of Jesus Christ. As he was upon that cross, he was fulfilling all that Messiah was to fulfill, his sacrificial death that washed our sins away. And then we also have the, uh, the witness of the Spirit. Upon salvation, the Holy Spirit dwells inside of us, and we see the Spirit moving within the body of Christ. And so what I want to focus upon, again, is verse 14, but starting at verse 13. I don't know if that makes sense or not, but nonetheless. So what John does in verse 13, he pretty much finishes his letter there. He, he, he's pretty much done. He's done this before. It's kind of a concept that John uses in that he finished his gospel in John chapter 20, but then he went on to chapter 21. Well, he finishes it here in 13, but he still has some more things to say. In his gospel, in John chapter 20, verse 31, he says, But these things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, or the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So in that, he fulfilled his purpose for the writing of his gospel. Well, we look at verse 13 here again. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. So that was his purpose in writing this epistle. And so John wrote the gospel so that we would know who Christ is. He wrote the epistle so that, he, that we would know who we are in Christ. It was his purpose to, to show us the surety of our salvation. And we would live in the confidence that that brings into our lives, knowing that we are children of God. And so the remainder of this epistle, it's kind of a postscript. Kind of like what you would write a letter, and then you're finished with it, you put the salutation on it and all, and you thought, oh yeah, I wanted to bring that, or, or yeah, there's one more point, and you would write, oh, P.S., and then you would write, the rest of it, well, verses 14 through 21 are the P.S. John believes that he has fulfilled his purposes. But what we're going to see here is, is John's final thoughts that he thought important enough to not leave, lead them, leave them out of the epistle. And so we pay attention to every word that is of God's word. But there are certain things that I think God really wants to get our attention. And I think this was written in this particular manner so that we would pay attention. So you have a surety that you're born again. You have a surety that you're right with God. And for those of us who are, John's got some final thoughts for us here today. And so he thinks it important to lead us with verses 14 through 17, the importance of prayer. Verse 18, that you are no longer seen as a sinner by God. Verse 19, that you are a child of God. And verse 20, the purpose of God. Now notice how each of these points that John starts out with, who the beneficiary is, we. He says in verse 14, now this is the confidence that we. He's speaking of us as a fellow brother in the Lord Jesus Christ that we're all part of this family. Verse 18, we, we know. Verse 19, we know. Verse 20, we know. So four points that he's making that are pertinent to the born-again believer's life. And so if you are born again, if, if you're a child of God here today, God's got specific points for you. Well, Pastor Mike, every time we gather, doesn't he have that? Well, yes, he does. But I think today, He's just trying to get, and next week, he's going to be trying to get our attention. He, there's certain things that he's just wanting us to remember, wanting us to know, and wanting us to not forget. And so the context, now it's always important to understand the context, because we're going to be looking throughout this epistle and even into the gospel, understanding that John is the writer, ultimately it's the Holy Spirit, who is the author of both the gospel and the epistle, but we're going to be looking at the context in which John was writing these things in order to understand some of the things that can be kind of hard to understand, to know where John is coming from, to understand 
who he is talking to and why he is talking to us in the manner in which he is talking to us. And so in context, these are those who believe in the witness of the water, the blood, and and the spirit, the things that we see in verses 6 through 13 of this chapter. Those who love the brethren have a desire for righteousness and those who are well, have a proper knowledge of who Jesus Christ is. Now, he's starting out, which is probably, you know, I I can't say it's the most important thing in our Christian lives because everything is important, but I think it needs to be stated as important because it can be so easily neglected or easily done in routine, and that's prayer. That's prayer. See, as Americans, we've got certain rights, And one of the rights that I have is the right of free speech. Well, in Christianity, one of your greatest rights as a child of God is free speech. You can freely speak to the Father whenever it is that you desire. Matter of fact, we are told to pray or to speak to the Father without ceasing. And so again, we become a child of God and we have this right. Matter of fact, our God wants 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 to hear from us. Now, Attached to the word we in verses 18, 19, and 20 is the word no. Now we've seen in this epistle that John kind of uses a play on words because Greek has two words for the word no, as I know something. How do you know it? Well, if you gnosko it, that's the Greek word for no, that means you know by experience. You may know my wife, but I really know my wife. I've lived with her for the past almost 40 years. And so we've gotten to really know each other through experience. Now, I know Abraham Lincoln. Never met the man, but I've read books. So I don't gnosko Abraham Lincoln, but I, there's another Greek word for the word no. I oida Abraham Lincoln. And so... John will use this play of words interchangeably throughout this epistle. And usually it's in the form of gnosko, and it speaks of our relationship that we have with Jesus Christ. But now in these concepts of our relationship with Jesus Christ, he changes to the word oida. And so these are things that we have learned is the idea. And so as he starts out, verses 18, 19, and 20, when he says, we know, we oida, or we know because we've learned these things. 19, we know because we've learned this. Verse 20, we know because we have learned this. So the instruction that John is given us here has come from the instruction that John received. And that's the same way that we are to conduct our Christian lives, especially looking at it in the context of this church. We come here and we receive this book knowledge that we receive, this Bible book knowledge that we receive, for the purpose of being able to deliver it to other people. The gospel, I learn the gospel so that I can give the gospel to somebody else. I can explain it to them in a means which they're able to digest it, to use their intellect that God has given them so that they would come to the conclusion of Jesus. Christ as Lord and Savior. Also, I would receive this information so that I could give it to my children or my grandchildren or spouse, whatever it might be, that I would be well instructed in the Lord and the things of the Lord. That's called maturity. As we learn, we mature in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And so today we're going to be looking at two of his final thoughts, and these final thoughts are concerning prayer. As I said, prayer one of the most neglected things within the church, and neglected according to my experience, what I have observed, what I know by observation, is for a couple of reasons. First of all, it's something that we can do without even thinking. I remember my son asked me when, before we were saved, it was right at the time we were getting saved, we were still Catholics, and he was wanting to, or we were sending him through to have his first Holy Communion, and one of the things he needed to learn what is called the Our Father, the Lord's Prayer that we see in Matthew chapter 6. He says, Dad, what is this prayer? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, the kingdom come, will be done with us in heaven. You know, just can rattle right off. Or, or before we eat, we always said prayer. Uh, Bless us, Lord, in these thy gifts which are about to receive from the body of the Christ, the Lord. Amen. What does it mean? Don't have a clue. Didn't really care. Just knew we got to eat once we said it. Was that really a prayer? You may call it a prayer, but it wasn't praying to God. It it was just speaking words out into the air. 
And, and so we can so easily do that. We can even easily do that in here because we're human and we're imp imperfect people. And, you know, hey, will you pray for me? I'm really struggling right now. Sure, I'll pray for you. And you never pray for him. You had intended to pray for him, but you just never did. And, and you have to understand that's a vow that you just made before the Lord to that person to pray for them and understand the importance of the prayer. Or, or, or you're, you're getting ready to, well, again, getting ready to eat, and will you say the prayer before the table? And you, you say a prayer, but you're really thinking about the prime rib that's sitting before you. And we can easily go in those directions. And so, you know, again, we're imperfect people. And also, there's the times when we might be embarrassed. I remember when first time I was sitting in a small group. It was the first small group after I got saved that I ever attended. And at the end of the small group, I thought it was kind of cool. It was neat to get, you know, with guys who are Christians as I'm becoming and understanding all these things that are going on. And at the end, he says, okay, does anybody have any prayer requests? And okay, yeah, that's good. I'm going to have people praying for me and all that. And I kind of understood the concept a little bit. And then we all gave our prayer requests. And he goes, okay, we're going to go around and pray. And that scared me to death. I mean, I've never prayed out loud, just free form praying. You know, again, I always depended upon the structure, and I've never just prayed out loud, just talking to God. And so there was an intimidation factor there. I, I made it through, I got through, I didn't die, they didn't kick me out of the church, and everything that worked out really well. But I've noticed there's some people that are scared to death to pray. And I even noticed it as the pastor. They're even more afraid to pray in front of the pastor. I don't know why that is, because I'm just a person like you are. And what I've come to know, it doesn't matter what we would consider a good prayer or a bad prayer. Well, a bad prayer is a prayer that you're praying that's not directed to God. A good prayer is a prayer that you are directed to God. Well, I'm just concerned about how I pray. Don't worry about it, because you're not praying to anybody here. You're praying to him up there. And that's really, you know, some of the greatest prayers that I have heard. There was one lady that, in our Christian life, she went to the same church, involved in the same ministry, and I just knew when this woman prayed, like the gates of heaven opened up. She was so elegant, but she was very heartfelt as well. And this woman was just amazing prayer. But I've heard some prayers from some immature Christians because they're new in the faith, but they're heartfelt. And they were just as intense and, and just as right in the sight of God in that mature woman who had such a beautiful prayer. And, and so God just wants to hear from her children, from his children. I, I, I turned on the um, FaceTime the other day, or, or no, it was my birthday, and Max called me. Max is my three-year-old grandson. We didn't have any in-depth conversations. It was pretty much, happy birthday, Papa, and then he saw a fly, a squirrel, and he went running off to it. But hey, that was cool that he called me and I, I got to hear from him. And the father just wants to hear from his children. And it, it doesn't matter. He just wants some FaceTime with you. And so a couple of things concerning prayer that we're going to look at. First thing, if you're a born-again believer, you're to have a confidence in your prayer. It's not just I hope that God answers this. It's not that I hope that God hears this. God, through the Apostle John, wants you to be confident in your prayer. Look at verses 14 and 15. Now this is the confidence or the surety that we have in him that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. So what you can see here is some qualifications and maturity that is necessary in our prayer life. So first of all, John uses the most generic word for prayer, prayer. Prayer is just, once again, simply talking to God. Now, underneath prayer will be intercessions and thanksgivings and so on and so forth. That's all prayer, but, and it's what he's using, the most generic term, but it's an umbrella for all the prayers that we offer to the Lord. There are two things that John wants us to be confident in our Christian life, as we've seen in this epistle as a whole. The first one is, he wants you to be confident in your eternal security. In chapter 2, verse 28, 
It says, and now little children, abide in him, and when he appears, we may have confidence or surety and not be ashamed before him at his coming. And then chapter 5, verse 18, it's one of the things that we know because we've been taught this, that whoever is born of God does not sin, but he who has been born of God keeps himself and the wicked one does not touch him. We'll get into what that means next week, but the idea is God no longer sees you as a sinner, and you can have a confidence in that, a surety, imperfect person such as I am, God has chosen to forgive me, casting all of my sins as far as the east is from the west and no longer seeing me as a sinner. So I can have a surety in that I'm secure because the work was done by Jesus Christ, not by myself. And secondly, well, it's this confidence that we see here in my prayer, that my God hears me, that my God has an ear to hear. And and, and there's been so many times that this has just been so misrepresented, even through the denomination that I used to be part of. Well, God's out directing the universe, and sometimes he's a little busy, so you can pray to his mother or one of these other saints or whatever it might be. No, I got the ear of God. And if you got the ear of God, cling to the ear of God. Why would you want to pray for a dead person that could do nothing of their situation, even if they did make it into heaven? And no, you you cling to the Lord because it's the Lord who is able to represent you and to do for you. There's no other mediator between man and God other than the Lord Jesus Christ. And so our confidence that God has saved us goes hand in hand with our confidence that God hears us. Two things in this Christian life that if you can truly grasp onto, you're able to make it through the hard times and the difficult days. Yeah, this is going, yeah, but I'm saved. I'm a child of God. I'm born again. And also, I can pray in the midst of it, and I can pray according to God's will. So today, again, in verses 14 through 15, one thing I want you to do, if you keep a list, if you don't start, add this to your biblical promises. And how, what better place to start if you haven't in prayer? This promise is huge and should cause you to reevaluate the means in which you approach God through prayer. In the places that you are promised, that your prayers are heard, there are qualifications that are attached. So this is important to understand. In places in the scripture, and there's more than what I will tell you, you can do the study if you want, but we are told that God hears our prayer. There are qualifications that are attached to it. First, number one is implied, it's the grace of God. It's not, I don't earn these things. But in chapter three, turn your page over if you like, verse 21, beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have a confidence towards God, And whatever we ask, we receive from him. But the qualification, because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. Now, again, it's not keeping the commandments perfectly. The commandments, we got to go back to that. Well, we've made this very clear. It's the commandments that we have from Jesus Christ to love God with all of our heart and to love others as we love ourselves. As I'm focused upon that, how are my prayers going to be directed They're going to be directed according to the will of God. If my chief priority is to love God for all I'm worth, my prayers are going to be directed towards God and the heart of God. If my desires are to love the brethren as I desire to be loved, then the directive of my prayer is going to be according to the people who I fellowship with and the people who are born-again believers in close proximity to my life. In John chapter 15, verse 7 the Lord says, if, if you abide in me, if you live your life in the commands of the Lord Jesus Christ, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. Really, anything I desire will be done for me? No, because if you're abiding in Christ and his words, then your desires are going to be God's desires and you'll be praying according to his will. In John 15, 16, it says, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. 
And so the idea is to go out and minister to people. And as you're going out and ministering to people, you're going to be praying along the lines of the Lord. And so what we're seeing here is, is this pattern of a person's heart who is directed not towards the flesh, not towards wants, not even so much towards needs, but towards whatever the will of God is. Because we understand that that's the prayer that God answers. So this tells me that prayer is not the means in which we change the will of God, but it is the means that we are changed according to the will of God as we become more and more like Jesus Christ, as we come, become more and more obedient to the word of God. Commentator of the 18th century Charles Dodd said, Prayer rightly considered is not a device for employing the resources of omnipotence to fulfill our desires, but a means by which our desires may be directed according to the mind of God and made into the channels for the forces of His will. Not my will, Lord, but Your will be done. And so this is a prayer that God will answer. And as I pray that prayer, really I'm praying to God that prayer, not my will, but your will be done. I am praying that prayer to God, but for myself. And it's then that I pray properly for a brother or sister who is hurt and whatever it might be. Stacy, I think you dropped your credit card there. Okay. I was going to say, well, I'll just pick it up later and <laughs> we'll fulfill your tithe for the rest of the year, but... <laughs> But we had an opportunity to exercise this before service, the Kalinowski family, you know, with the passing of Linda's mom, and to be able to pray because we love Linda and her brother and the family, and we have this opportunity to pray for them and during their time of hurt and during their time of need. I mean, that's loving the brethren, and, and this is a prayer that God's going to answer. God, we're going to see this, God is going to give them peace as they seek him out. And so in this promise, we also must consider that he hears us. Never think that as you pray, even if you're praying improperly, he does hear you. But this is going one step further. As we're praying according to the will of God, he hears us. Now that terminology is along the lines of he hears us with the intent of answering us. And so when my grandkids come over and they ask something of me, do I give them everything they ask for? Pretty much, but not everything. No, I, I don't give them everything because there's certain things that are going to be harmful, certain things that are not beneficial to their lives or certain things that their parents will get really, really mad at me if I did. You know, Papa, will you buy me a horse? That's probably not something I'm going to do. But as soon as I hear, Papa, will you? They've got my attention. And my intention is to answer the prayer if it's according to certain preset standards and so the idea is he hears us with the intent of granting our request so if i am on god's page if you will if i'm praying according to his will his desire is to answer our prayers now understand the confidence that you get from that because as you're praying according to god's will and he answers the prayer you're seeing the hand of god move I mean, what would happen in your Christian life if you knew whatever I prayed for that God was going to answer that prayer? Well, that's the promise that you're getting here as long as you pray according to the will of God. If you pray according to the will of God, you will experience the hand of God. And that's just an amazing thing. Another consideration to this promise is we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. This goes even deeper, it's even stronger. Of every request that you have ever made of God, when you have prayed according to the will of God, it has been granted to you. Now, according to this terminology, it doesn't mean that it will be granted to you. It is granted to you at the moment that you pray. Now, he may not do what he's going to do until later on, but at that moment, God says, okay. Now, again, it may be tomorrow, maybe next week. It's going to be according to God's timing. But when I pray a prayer according to the will of God, then he hears me. He has that intent to answer. And John tells me here, now this is the word of God. Doesn't mean that they're red letters or black letters. It's all God's word that I have that request. And so 
as I am praying for somebody to get sick, I need to pray according to God. Or I'm not praying for somebody to get sick. Let me rephrase that. I've never prayed that prayer before. As I'm praying for somebody who is sick. And as I start praying, and sometimes it's part of the process of prayer as we're praying for somebody, maybe even yourself, and sooner or later it works around to the will of God, and I have that request. Well, how does that work? I mean, you're praying, and you're not changing God. Yeah, God's changing you, and then you're getting on God's page, and then once you start praying, it only makes sense, according to the will of God, that we have that request. And so again, I can have a confidence. I can come before the Lord and I can pray. I know that God hears my prayers. And I know when I pray according to his will, I have the answer to that or I have the reality of that. Although that reality may not occur for a while. And so never get tired of prayer. Understanding the power that exists in prayer. And what John is wanting us to do is he's wanting us to pray. When does he want us to pray? He wants us to pray all the time. And so, what an amazing thing. You know, John, you could say, you know, John, when you write something, it's kind of out there. Matter of fact, you're making the Bible, so it's, gonna, it's been there for 2,000 years. You know, something you write on the Internet. You ever written something stupid on the Internet? I have. And, you know, just something that I regret later on. And you can click it off, but kind of the damage has already been done. It's already been out there. It's already been read. Uh, you know, or sent a letter, have you ever mailed the letter and think, oh, you know what, I didn't really want to say that, I really shouldn't have probably sent that, I was kind of angry when I sent it, but unfortunately it's out there at that point. Well, John, are you hearing from the Lord here? Because again, there's going to be some things, and even in the verses to follow, that are a little bit hard to understand and wanting to know exactly what he is saying and, and all. But, but John, obviously, is writing under inspiration of the Holy Spirit. It's not so much that John wants you to hear and know these things. It's God who wants you to know these things. Because when John was pinning these things, he knew where they were going to end up. Matter of fact, he wanted them to end up exactly where they ended up in the Word of God. Because they're not John's words, they're God's words. And God wants you to know these things. And so the things that you're dealing with, I, I've got prayer. I've got a surety if I'm praying according to his will that he hears me. And if I, if, it, if I can check those things off the list, I know that I have what I am praying for. And leave it in the will of God. Leave it in the will of God. And as we leave it in the will of God, we can walk confidently in that, that we did what we're supposed to do, and that God is going to do what he is going to do, what he's supposed to do, what he desires to do. And there's just an absolute peace that comes from that. It's the peace of God that surpasses understanding. In John chapter 14, verses 13 through 14, because, see, John knows these things. He oides these things. He knows these things because of the instruction that he had received from Jesus Christ. John 14, verses 13 through 14. And whatever you ask in my name, Jesus speaking, that I will do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. And John 16, 24. Until now you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. And so... What we're seeing here is, is kind of accumulation of the witnesses or the tests or whatever it might be, praying for others. What is the ultimate expression of Christian love is when a brother prays for a brother, and that encompasses male and female, obviously, but when we pray for one another. How do I know that I have the love of the brethren? Again, that was a test that uh, I'm born again. Well, if you pray for the brethren, you pray for the church, church specific, church general. You pray for God and pray to God for the will of God to come to pass. That speaks volumes. Well, it's, it's included in the word of God. So this is part of a practice of righteousness. So as I'm doing these things, I'm practicing righteousness. 
And, and, and also, I have a proper knowledge of how this works, and there's the knowledge of, of Jesus Christ and, and how these things work and how he represents me before the throne of God. And so all of those things are included in that. And so what John is writing in verses 14 through 21, that postscript, are the results of people who have received the witness of the love of the brethren practicing righteousness and the proper knowledge of who Jesus Christ is. These things are things that a Christian should know and a Christian should do. And so if you're a Christian, do you know these things? If you know these things, are you doing these things? Because what he brings into the equation now, making it clear, is the priority of praying for others. Verses 16 and 17. If anyone sees his brother sinning a sin which does not lead to death, he will ask and he will give him life for those who commit sin not leading to death. There is sin leading to death. I do not say that he should pray about that. All unrighteousness is sin and there is sin not leading to death. Now, first of all, I'll just preface by saying this. There's many good people who have different views on what this means. Matter of fact, some of the verbiage here will lend towards not really completely understanding exactly the direction that John is heading here. I think the Spirit gives us wisdom and makes it applicable to our particular personal situation. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take those two verses and we're going to look at it in context to what John has spoken to us in this epistle that we can get the best understanding that we possibly can. You can go home, you can pick up a commentary, and there may be a good commentator who has a different view than, than what I am going to be presenting. I'll, I'll point out some of the views. Well, I'll point them out now. Uh, first of all, what is a sin leading to death? And again, we're going to get in depth in that in just one minute. But some people believe that it is a physical death such as Ananias and Sapphira, committing a sin in which they die, you know, physically die. Some people believe it's a spiritual death, that there's not so much a death that happens here, but a spiritual death, sinning within the body of Christ and being cut out of a relationship with Jesus, or the, I should say the benefit of the relationship with Jesus Christ. And then thirdly, there are those who are false brethren within the church, and they are sinning the sin of unbelief. And how much worse as you're in the body of Christ. Matter of fact, that's the reason why John is writing this epistle, because the Gnostics were coming into the church and teaching false doctrines. He calls them false brethren. And that being the case, the church had these people that said they were believers, but in actuality they weren't, and they were, through their unbelief, sinning a sin that leads to death. And so we'll break this apart. You can build your own conclusions, and we can just go from there. So our priority so many times is to pray for ourselves, but God's priority is that you would pray for others. And so we need to look at these things in the light once again, as I stated before, God's greatest commandments. And that we love God, have a proper knowledge, verses 14 through 15, of God and who he is and how he hears. And that would result in the second that is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. It should cause us to pray for one another. And so... Prayer is not a blank check for our wants and pleasures, but it is responsibility that we have to pray for the welfare of our fellow believers. I'm just going to go over here real quick to Galatians chapter 6. We looked at it a little while ago in our men's study on Wednesday morning, but I think prayer, prays, or plays, prayer plays a big part in this. It says in chapter 6, verse 1, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, a willful sin, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness concerning yourself, lest you also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. The law of, didn't say the law of God, said the law of Christ. Love God and to love the brethren. How are we to do that? I think a big way we do that is prayer. Now understand that a burden is a heavy load that is hard to carry. And so you have somebody because sin, they're weighted down with this burden, Come alongside and support them in prayer. Minister to them, because we're told in verse 5, for each one shall bear his own load. What is my load? My load is to, as, as a member of the church, not as a pastor, although that's inclusive, but my load is to help you bear your burden. Now, how do you bear burden? It's supposed to carry sin around? No, to lead them to the place of chapter 1, verse 9, back in 1 John, if we confess our sins, he's faithful to forgive. 
to bring that person to the point that they deal with sin in God's ordained way. So, the instruction in this area of prayer also carries a qualification with it. First of all, there's three questions that we must consider in order to understand what is being said there. First, what is sin that leads to death? Well, first of all, what is death as it's stated here in this particular context? Well, it's in contrast to what I have just read when we started our service in verses um, verses 9 through 13, and actually verses 11 through 13, it says, and this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son does not have life. These things I have written to you that believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. And so in context of what John is writing, death would be either eternal death or a spiritual death. And in my way of thinking, and the way I see this, he is taking a physical death out of the equation. So I do not believe that he is talking of an Ananias and a Sapphira kind of a, of a death. Matter of fact, Pastor Chuck speaks of a woman who, when they first started Calvary Chapel, she came up against everything. And she was constantly causing problems. And Chuck went and prayed and prayed that God would, would do something about this woman or whatever. And then one morning, he got the phone call. She died. And Chuck, I remember saying in the pulpit, so God killed her. And we moved on. Well, you know, don't pray for somebody to die. And I'm not saying he did not pray for her to die. I'm not saying that. But pray for the people that they would find life here. And really, I think the Ananias and Sapphira illustration back in Acts chapter 6 or, or 5, the Acts, uh, Ananias and Sapphira illustration is given to us so that we would see the importance. Things were happening in the early church, and they were amplified so that we would see the importance in this particular case to not have pride and to not lie to the Holy Spirit. And so I do not believe that the death spoken of here is a physical death, but it is a spiritual death. Secondly, can a believer commit a sin worthy of spiritual death? Well, we're, again, in this particular case, we are talking about a born-again believer. Can they commit a sin that is worthy of spiritual death? And the answer is no. That's what John has been writing us about. So we've been looking at all these weeks. Look at 1 John chapter 3, verse 9. Whoever has been born of God does not sin, for his seed remains, the word remains in him, and he cannot sin because he has been born of God. Doesn't mean you can't commit a sin. It means that God does not see you as a sinner. And then look at verse 18 of back in chapter 5. This we know. We know because we've been instructed this, that whoever is born of God does not sin. He who has been born of God keeps himself, and the wicked one does not touch him. And so, looking at it from that perspective, this would then have to be somebody who seemed to be a believer, but was not a believer. They had no true love of the brethren. That's why John kept hammering that point. How many times did we talk about in, in, in this epistle the love that we are to have for the brethren? It got to the point when I would open my Bible to put my Bible study together and thinking, oh, no, not again, Lord. You know, what more do I, can I possibly say? And God says, they're still not doing it yet. Keep speaking about it. So we continue to do that. Matter of fact, he says, you're not doing it either. So, so there was people in that church who did not have a love for the brethren. They had no desire for righteousness because they were Gnostics who were going, trying to define God and Christianity according to their own intellect and not was right in the sight of God. And they did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah or that he was God. And we know what we're told in Romans chapter 8, verse 1. There is now, therefore, no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Who's in Christ? Those who love the brethren, work at righteousness, and believe that Jesus is the Messiah and the Son of God. Now, remember, it's important, that John previously recognized those in the church who were such people. 
who were counterfeit Christians, if you will. In John, 1 John chapter 2, verse 19, it says, They went out from us, but they were not of us. If they had been of us, if they had been part of God's family, they would have continued with us, but they went out that they might be made man manifest, that none of them were of us, that they would be manifest or revealed for who they are. And so... You had these belie so-called believers that were in the church, but in actuality, they were false converts. They were preaching a false gospel. And so you have to throw this into the mix. Again, there's good commentators that would say that this is a physical death that is being spoken of here, but it says, do not pray about that. If I knew that God was going to kill you, I would pray for you. I, I would pray that he would be gracious and that he would be merciful. Um, if it's just a death that, that he's bringing about because of false teaching, I mean, again, these things could be possible because there's good people that teach them, but it seems to be to be more nuts and bolts within the body of Christ of this reality that exists in there and how we are to face this reality. And so the Bible tells us that there is only one sin that will not be forgiven. Of all the sins that you've committed, one of these days I'll have one of you come up here and you can tell all the sins that you've ever committed, but it'll probably be a three-hour service. Of all the sins that you've ever committed, there's only one sin that is unforgivable. Matthew chapter 12, verses 31 through 32. Therefore I say to you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven men. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven him, either in this age or the age to come. And so what is blasphemy of the Holy Spirit? pretty important concept. Well, we're not going to get into a whole study on this, but since I brought it up, I think it would be unfair to leave you wondering. Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is to not receive the ministry of the Holy Spirit. What is the ministry of the Holy Spirit? As he fills born-again believers for the purpose of ministry. What's the purpose of ministry? The ultimate purpose of ministry is the preaching of the gospel. Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is the rejection of the gospel. Jesus said, you can blaspheme me. And so the idea is, you can deny that I'm God, and you can even hang me upon the cross. But that can be forgiven if you repent and you get right with God through faith in Jesus Christ. And so all of these sins that are contained in the scriptures, all these sins that you've committed, you can be forgiven of. And if you've received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you truly believe, then you have not, nor will you, commit the sin of blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. And so this would be the sin of the unbeliever who has rejected the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so why would we not pray for such a person? Again, verse 16. If anyone sees his brother sinning a sin which does not lead to death, he will, and so you can compare that again with Galatians chapter 6 that we looked at as far as the burden and the load, verses 1 through 5. Um, if anyone sees his brother sinning a sin which does not lead to death, he will ask and he will give him life for those who commit sin not leading to death. And so you compare this with what is mentioned in verses 14 through 15. And so this tells me never stop praying for loved ones or acquaintances who are not walking right with the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, this is speaking of believers. He will ask, he will, he will give him life for those um, who commit sin not leading to death. Now he says, there is sin leading to death. I do not say that he should pray about that. Why do we not pray about that? Now what he's not saying is, he's not saying don't pray for unbelievers. Pray that unbelievers would get saved. There's no other prayer that is going to be effective in an unbeliever's life. Don't pray that a unbeliever stops committing this sin or that sin or their life gets better. Don't pray that their life, well, pray that their life does get worse if it's going to lead them to salvation. But the only thing that matters in an unbeliever's life is that they get right with Jesus Christ. And yes, we should pray for that. But what is the prayer in the context of what he is talking about? He's talking about a believer who is sinning that they need to get right. But 
it doesn't make any sense to pray for an unbeliever who is sinning. Because an unbeliever who's sinning is just doing what comes natural to him. And so to pray for an unbeliever to, to stop sinning, it doesn't do any good. And you can even bump this up another notch. To pray that an unbeliever gets into heaven, well, that's futile. Just, just to pray that nothing changes. And I, Lord, I just pray that you would just open the doors and just let this one guy in, just do me a favor. You know, that, that doesn't work. Pray that they get right with Jesus Christ because it's only through a right relationship with Jesus Christ that no longer are they involved in that sin that is going to be leading to death. Now they have come into God's glorious light. And so looking at the context of what is being said here, looking at all that John has said, as far as I'm concerned, that's the best interpretation of what is being said here. He says, all unrighteousness is sin, verse 17, and there is sin not leading to death. And for the unbeliever, I'm sorry, for the born-again believer, the sins we commit don't lead to eternal death. Now, they're going to lead to misery in this life, but they don't lead to eternal death. Now, case in point, and I'll close with this, in Luke chapter 22, verses 31 through 32, you have somebody who seems to have lost his salvation, you seem to have a believer who has committed the sin that is led, that is going to lead to death. Now, as Apostle Peter that I'm talking about, he said boastful things. He even said that, Lord, I'll die for you. But then that little servant girl challenged him in who he was, and he couldn't stand up for Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus had warned him in Luke chapter 22, verses 31 through 32, and the Lord said, Simon, Simon, notice he didn't say Peter, Peter, he said, Simon, Simon. Simon was his old, old, old life, his old name. It was a name that he received from his father just as he received the nature of his father. And so the context in which he's speaking to Peter is Peter's sinful nature. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. Have you ever been there? Satan never sifted you as wheat? You know, just, just the temptation and just became overcome and just like Peter he determined that he was going to go back to his own life because he failed and you just feel like a failure and you just feel like you just you just lost it that he may sift you as wheat Jesus said but I have prayed for you the example the ultimate love that God has even for the believer when they're lost in a sin but I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail and when you have returned to me, and again, we should have a confidence in that. And when you have returned to me, he's going to return because you pray anything according to God's will. He hears it, and you have that. And so notice the surety that Jesus was praying from. He didn't say, and if you return, he says, and when you return. And so he's got a definite confidence in that. And just understand the weight that that lends towards our prayer, the confidence that we should have as we pray these prayers. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. Tell them about your failure. Tell them about the times when you struggled and you failed and you thought more of yourself than you could because everybody does that. And Peter, thou your valuable tool within the kingdom of God. You will be a valuable tool in the kingdom of God. So I have to ask, what was Peter's saving grace in this situation? Now, I know Jesus knows the hearts of all men, but from our perspective, what did Jesus recognize in the apostle Peter that would set him apart from somebody who would deny Christ? Oh, we'll, we'll say Judas. What set him apart is Peter had a love for the brethren. Peter had a desire to live righteously, and Peter had the proper understanding of who Jesus Christ is. And because of that, we see the proofs of Peter's born-again life. And because of that, Jesus prayed for him, this sin not leading to death. And we know that Peter was restored. What did Peter then do? He dictated a gospel to Mark, and he wrote some epistles. He strengthened the brethren. And so we need to understand there's always potential. There's potential for the backslider. There's the potential for the one who seems to walk away. What do we do? We continue to pray, to exhibit that love for the person who is the believer. If there's an unbeliever, if you're just not, what if you're not sure? Because we don't know the hearts of everybody. Pray that they get right with Christ. That's the universal prayer. 
pray that they get right with the Lord Jesus Christ. But if they're an unbeliever, Pastor Mike, well, then that's between them and God. But you, from a heart of love, have that heart that desires people walking right with Jesus Christ, walking strongly and walking in victory. Because just as our dear Josie went to home to be with the Lord, one day we will all go home and to be with the Lord. And we will be with him in glory. And oh, how our heart yearns within us, how we look forward to that day. And then we're going to understand the reality and the details of all of these things. But until now, the thing that we know are the things that we've been instructed in by the Bible. And those are the things that in our Christian lives, we must cling to. Father, once again, we just thank you, God, for your word, your word, Lord. It just shows the purpose of church. The purpose of church, Lord, is to prepare us for the good works that you have for us outside of these walls. That, God, I pray for the people who are here today. I pray, Lord, that they would grasp on to what you have told them and the instruction that you have given them and just pray, God, that we would digest these things into our Christian lives. And so, Father, I just pray that you would fill us with your spirit, God, Use this in great and glorious ways. Again, we have this time of the season that you even give us opportunity with people who pretty much ignore the church throughout the year. And now they're looking for this, uh, at least singing the songs, Lord, of Christ our Savior is born. And Lord, we have an opportunity to show them of what they sing of. And so, Father, we just thank you for your goodness and the sureties that you give us in these areas. More to come next week, that, Father, we would truly be people sold out to you. Lord, I lift up this last worship song and pray that you would fill us with your spirit. Pray, Father, that we would be a people who would sing out, rejoice, understanding that we are worshiping him who is seated upon the throne. We thank you and praise you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. We all stand, please?